Hi, everyone. Uh, I want to do a little bit of um, a deep dive into the uh, AI industry, uh, what uh, today uh, we, we know as the, the generative AI um, landscape. And um, it, it's very interesting. I think it makes sense to cover it right now because I think there is a lot of uh, uh, you know confusion about uh, um, what's going on in the AI industry. It's very easy to get very cynic about it and just um, um, you know look at it as uh, is, uh, it is just all a buzz. But I think it's very extremely important to look at uh, what's going on right now, how the um, AI, uh, the generative models, what we know, gener uh, um, we call generative models, which is what it is AI right now. Uh, and uh, I'll explain it in, in a few minutes. And really the commercial applications around which uh, the AI is exploding, uh, what makes sense, um, how uh, the, the, the future market is gonna develop. And I look at it from a commercial standpoint, that's my uh, sweet spot. Uh, I've been looking at uh, the AI industry uh, in the last uh, years. I've been following the commercial applications as I worked in the field from a commercial standpoint. I've been, sell I've been selling AI services uh, already uh, back in 2019 going forward. So I, I saw the, the evolution of AI and uh, I saw how it all started to make sense um, in, in back in 2019 from a commercial standpoint. Of course, uh, there were uh, fears before uh, the, the the commercial evolution, especially like the 2017 has been the year as, as we're going to see where where there has been this um, you know the start of the this explosion. And of course, uh, from a from a commercial standpoint, I remember that the things started to make sense with the GPT-2. Uh, where uh, finally uh, I, I recognized that uh, there was a commercial application for it. And actually uh, the, the AI generated was starting to make a lot of sense. First in producing more abstract uh, uh, things and then later on in becoming way more um, you know, uh, uh, applicable to, to uh, practical uh, stuff. So uh, let's make a sense a little bit of uh, this industry. I want to do a, a deep dive. Um, uh, I'll try to go through uh, also the latest news about it, and I'll start with uh, this uh, with this map here, with this, which which is a map which was put together by by Sequoia, the VC firm, uh, firm, and I think it's um uh, it's very um you know it, it's a good map because it's uh, very simple uh, and simplified because of course uh, there are way more AI, AI industry AI companies uh, out there, way way more companies, and also a lot of uh, interesting ones out there that are not uh, in this map but i think it's uh, quite um, you know simple map which explains uh, the few uh, commercial applications where the ai right now makes sense and of course those comprise text uh, generation video generation uh, image generation uh, code uh, generation uh, speech um, you know recognition and also uh, generation right now uh, you know other application like in gaming music uh, audio but also 3d now, uh, it's uh, it's quite interesting. Uh, I cover uh, the AI industry uh, also as well in my newsletter, among many other things, uh, on you know on on my blog for Week MBA and then on my newsletter, which is called the Business uh, uh, Engineer. And um, I go through uh, you know um, a lot of this stuff. But the AI industry is quite interesting to me because uh, it's one of those industry where. Uh, right now, there is an explosion. Of course, there are also a lot of uh, uh, discussions about what the eye can and cannot do. And I think those discussions are extremely important. Uh, but I think it's a great industry because uh, it's uh, it also shows, um, it is also developing a lot of commercial applications. Now, the, the question is whether, uh, how those will work at scale, whether they will be able to work as well at scale. And also, I think uh, they will pose a, a lot of issues uh, in terms of, um, uh, uh, copyright, uh, as we'll see, there are a lot of challenges. Uh, just like you know, the, the way I see it, just like uh, you know, with the with the early uh, un internet, uh, uh, especially web uh, 2.0, like with the, with the companies like YouTube or like um, uh, other companies that uh, leverage a lot on user generated content, uh, where there was a lot of um, uh, questions open about you know um, uh, what's going on with the, with the copyright of uh, these things generated, I think also for the is gonna be the same thing as we'll see. But, you know, there, there, there have been a few news lately about uh, three main uh, companies, uh, one of the largest in the AI space, one is Stability AI, 
which announced uh, you know, a few days ago over 100 million uh, in funding for uh, developing its open source uh, artificial intelligence platform. Uh, Jasper AI, which is one of the main uh, AI content platforms, uh, which has a lot of users, uh, which again raised 125 million at uh, 1.5 billion valuation. And then OpenAI, which was initially a research lab turned into a, you know, a for-profit company that um, actually was valued at nearly 20 billion uh, and is uh, in advanced uh, talks with uh, with Microsoft. I will see why if you're Microsoft, you're going to be interested in AI uh, behind, of course, uh, the fact that you want to be on top of uh, the next uh, industry. And I think when it comes to, to application, of course, uh, there are a few things that um, we uh, want to highlight. Of course, AI right now, it's um, making uh, much, much cheaper the production of uh, content. Of course, uh, over time, it is also important to, to, to uh, ask uh, whether uh, this content that AI is generating uh, uh, belongs to whom, meaning especially when it comes, uh, not, you know, when it comes to text, is uh, a little bit uh, less uh, tricky uh, because, of course, uh, if the text uh, is a new text, um, you can say that it has, uh, you know, it has been uh, be generated as a new text, even though it has been trained on a corporate content that is not, uh, you know, um, owned by 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 you. So the 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 matter is a, is a little bit less complex, but still there is a huge issue as well in terms of um, uh, potential uh, copyright issues, but especially when it comes to image generation, it uh, stays very open the question about uh, who uh, uh, this content belongs to, uh, especially uh, if, for instance, imagine the case that um, we are generating an image using uh, the style of uh, uh, various painters, uh, you know, uh, and using as a training data set images coming from whatever data set is not uh, owned by us, um, who is going to be the copyright holder for the, the final output of the image, even though the image has uh, generated a whole new um, type of content? You know, that, that's an open question. So it's very important to understand that why, uh, while AI is uh, indeed um, lowering a lot the, the, the cost of producing content, especially the, the low end, um, of uh, the, the 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 market content, then the question is about um, you know whether this is going to make sense uh, from from a, a scaling perspective. Another part of the AI industry which is quite interesting is about software. Uh, I think in the next ten years, of course, um, we're going to call uh, any software company we're going to call it an uh, AI company, uh, meaning that you know the the uh, foundation of uh, any company operating is going to be a set of AI algorithms. Uh, and from a practical standpoint, it just means that, uh, you know, uh, all the automations that we're going to have in software tomorrow, those, those will be driven by, by AI. Um, and uh, this also connects to another point, which is about coding, uh, which is going to be uh, much uh, more accessible to the masses. And therefore, also people uh, that uh, are not coders will be able to actually build stuff online, build, uh, building stuff online. Uh, and uh, digital stuff, but also physical stuff, as we'll see through the use of AI. And it's quite interesting because uh, it shows that actually if you are uh, good at uh, what's called the prompting, meaning if you're good then um, uh, you know, uh, making sure that machine understands the command that you're trying to give it, then you can get a very unique output. And uh, usually, usually prompting is not about uh, being a, a good co uh, coder. It's uh, about being able to uh, really uh, represent in abstract what you want the machine to generate. For the first time, you speak the uh, you know the, the natural language, and then the machine can actually generate in interesting stuff. Robotics, where of course uh, the AI uh, infused into into robots, uh, is generating uh, you know physical robots that are able to do more and more stuff, more and more tasks. Of course, the question is open uh, of where we're gonna get. Uh, also, you know, if you wish, within robotics, uh, we we can. Uh, we can have another field, which is that of uh, self-driving. Also, that the question is open of uh, where the eye um, can, you know, can can what the eye can actually do. And you know, my perspective, as I will explain, I think uh, the the eye, especially as it is conceived today, so the generative AI, is not going to be able to be completely uh, autonomous. Uh, quite the opposite. I think uh, that uh, you're going to be able to actually have great AI. If you design a proper context for it, we're going to see it in one of the newsletter issues that um, that um, I put together in what I like to, you know, uh, in what is called uh, human in the loop AI, 
meaning that also when it comes to the self-driving, I, I do not believe in the dream of cars that can, you know, uh, drive 100% alone in a very ambiguous context, uh, like uh, like uh, cities, uh, like New York City, or so like in Naples in Italy. I think um, it's going to be um, uh, way more um, different kind of, uh, of, uh, of uh, success, meaning that still the AI is going to work at scale, but it's going to be uh, the the uh, just like in the self-driving case, it's going to work when we're going to design a context for it. So, for instance, uh, you uh, design uh, highways where just uh, self-driving cars will be able to uh, to be there. You're not going to have a pedestrian. You're not going to have uh, human-driven uh, cars. You're just going to have a cars driven by AI. And then if that's the case, then the AI is going to be successful because you're designing a linear environment, an environment where, uh, yes, there, there might be unpredictable events, but those are generated by other machines that follow more or less the same logic within a controlled uh, context. And then there is another aspect, which is about uh, AR and VR, where I think um, AI is going to be extremely useful from a modeling and also from, from a standpoint of building that uh, the, the, the uh, uh, virtual world, but also the mixed, rea mixed reality world, meaning it's going to make it much cheaper, first of all, to mo model the world around, meaning that imagine the case that tomorrow I'm going to wear uh, you know, some uh, Apple glasses or like, again, Google glasses or like, who knows, Meta glasses. And uh, those smart glasses will be able to uh, reconstruct a sort of mixed reality world as I go along by using AI modeling. So by by sort of uh, projecting these uh, mixed reality world uh, as as a walk in the real world, this is going to be uh, AI driven. And also uh, the a lot of uh, objects that uh, are, will be generated, for instance, within this uh, uh, physical environment, but also uh, fully uh, digital environment will be uh, through the use of AI. So the bet is, as um, you know, I explained uh, that in the next five, 10 years, we'll see a more and more start, start, startups in many verticals from retail to finance to whatever, uh, driven by AI. This is gonna be very interesting because it means that uh, this is gonna lower the cost um, of uh, doing business, which doesn't mean that it's gonna improve the success of doing business because the success of doing business is gonna be still a winner take all, if at all, actually. Uh, we're going to have way more participants in the game, but still the same number of winners. Uh, but uh, uh, anyhow, um, uh, the, the interesting aspect is that we're going to have more uh, niches, meaning we're going to have uh, more uh, verticals, which are smaller and smaller, where we can add value. And then, of course, you're going to get the same consolidated giants, which will be able to offer value horizontally. So it means that from a vertical standpoint, we're going to be able to add more and more value as, as a micro niche. Uh, and on the horizontal uh, the, you know, way, there will be the same giants that will be able to add a lot of value, a little bit of value to everyone. So there will be many, company, uh, many companies driven by AI, also billion dollars company. Uh, and uh, the bet is those companies will be uh, led by very small teams, very lean teams. So if uh, we uh, lived in the digital era where uh, very small teams, like 30 or 50 people, could be the, like a 100 billion company, probably with the AI, it is going to be amplified. So we're going to get like team of like 5, 10 people who will build something extremely valuable uh, at consumer uh, consumer level, uh, potentially 100 billion or, you know, a trillion dollar company with a very small team. So um, uh, I think uh, this is the point of uh, where we need to understand what's going on with the so-called uh, AI revolution. I think... Uh, uh, in 2017, Kevin Kelly explained it extremely well when he, pre he, he predicted to, that the, the next uh, formula for the next uh, 10,000 startups was you take something, you add the AI to it, and you get uh, uh, the you know the, the next AI startup, and that's that's how we're gonna get the AI revolution. Now, uh, I want to like uh, I would like to uh, highlight, emphasize that today most of the AI that we get is uh, is deep learning, meaning it's um, so it's a subset of uh, machine learning that does. Uh, specific things, uh, we're going to uh, see what that is. But uh, really, the paradigm of uh, today AI is a transformer based architecture uh, where, uh, you know, this turning pa point of this paradigm was probably 2017 when there was a paper which was called uh, Attention uh, is uh, all, all You Need. And uh, in a tech talk in 2018, uh, Jeffrey uh, Hinton actually uh, explained that. Uh, 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 today, uh, this new paradigm is is uh, about um, you know really uh, solving uh, having the AI solving problems by telling it less and less. Meaning that 
um, the AI, the machine learning, deep learning network is going to be able to, 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 to learn. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the uh, transformer-based uh, architecture is, uh, is quite uh, interesting. And, and again, this started with a paper in 2017, which was called Attention is All You Need, because uh, pretty much uh, there was a, a sort of revolution within uh, this, uh, this um, DOSE model where uh, you got an attention mechanism, which, which was the trigger for the, the, the neurons within the, ne the neural, neural networks. Of course, those are all uh, analogies that are used in the AI industry, uh, you know, neurons, neural networks, but uh, it doesn't mean that uh, the AI is as complex as the brain, quite the opposite, it's uh, still very far from it. So I think it's extremely important also to understand that uh, the while the AI industry is using a lot of uh, terms which uh, refer to uh, bi biological stuff, it's uh, still very far from it, it's still... <laughs> Uh, not at the point of uh, generating the so-called uh, artificial general intelligence. And also the, the question is open of whether we're going to get there. You know, there are some school of thought that uh, believe that it's just a matter of time that we get there. Other school of th thought that believe that we're not going to get there. To me, um, uh, I don't think we're going to uh, necessarily get there. I think uh, the, the question of believing that uh, the AI is going to be uh, able to uh, replace humans also from a from uh, from you know from from every standpoint uh, it's uh, it's uh, the wrong question because uh, if you compare the, the the machine with the human in terms of tasks i think it's the wrong way to look at uh, the the matter right now uh, i think uh, there is um, you know there, there is uh, there is uh, something more to humans that is uh, hard to explain from a scientific standpoint and science and uh, uh, AI is going to be extremely useful from a practical standpoint. It's going to be very useful from uh, from an entrepreneur standpoint. But again, I would be very careful to actually go into a discussion where uh, we tend to look at the AI as a replacer for humans, because these are very limited view of uh, what uh, humans are. Also, it uh, just is a materialistic view, meaning that um, it assumes that we humans are just a piece of uh, uh, electrical impulses uh, and. Um, I think this is a very limited view, uh, so I'm not going to go uh, further into the discussion, but I think it's uh, really the wrong question whether the uh, AI is going to be, uh, you know, um, like um, uh, it's going to be able to replace in everything humans. I think it's more uh, what uh, it, uh, it is interesting to me, it's more about understanding right now uh, what are the commercial applications that we can use in the entrepreneurial world to build more valuable stuff at scale with smaller teams, meaning we do less politics, we do more stuff, we build much more. So we focus more and more on products rather than doing uh, organizational design, which is what happens when you need to actually build something at scale. So with the AI, uh, we can build uh, very massive products, uh, meaning products that uh, reach a lot of people with uh, very small teams. This is interesting to me. And the other aspect which is interesting to me that is worth exploring is, uh, again, the human in the loop, meaning how do you combine uh, the understanding that uh, the human is about the, the, the real world and the AI is about the real world to actually generate valuable stuff? Because uh, while uh, many try to compare the AI with um, the way humans think, uh, yet, um, you know, I think uh, those are completely different approaches, meaning that the human makes sense of, uh, of the real world uh, and uh, of an ambiguous environment by simplifying the world and uh, by using heuristics which uh, um, opposite to what many uh, understand about uh, heuristics, especially in the last 10 years, uh, they look at uh, heuristics as a limitation of uh, human understanding on the real world. In reality, heuristics in many cases work better than uh, computational, uh, you know, computational uh, models, because in a complex environment, you don't want more data um, to, to actually solve a problem. You actually want to understand the definition of a problem because no one is going to give you that definition in the real world. So as a human, uh, you know how to actually navigate a very complex environment with, with very few, uh, actually, uh, even without any data points. Instead, if you're a machine right now, in order for you to, to, to work, you need the opposite. You need a huge, huge amount of data to actually make sense of the world because uh, those transformer based model were while they can generalize meaning those are trans those transformer based uh, can do a lot of um, uh, uh, more tasks that they were designed for uh, it's still true that in order for them to work on other tasks they need to be retrained over and over again and the retraining the retraining process can be extremely expensive and still to train a model it takes uh, billions of parameters uh, as of today
So uh, I think it's, uh, again, uh, worth um, um, exploring a little bit of uh, what's going on with the, the, uh, the, the, the rise of AI industry. As explained so far, again, I think, uh, uh, first of all, it's uh, interesting to understand what AI can do. Uh, and uh, right now, AI can do a lot of uh, cool stuff. And the interesting thing is that it can do it uh, by uh, really using, uh, you know, uh, not much code, but by using what's called the prompting. So uh, here in this example, I'm um, using, uh, uh, you know, prompt base, uh, which um, I think right now is using a stable, diff a stable diffusion as an underlying model to actually generate my own sunglasses. So I, I input a very simple prompt like, you know, sunglasses, round shaped, uh, a rectangular shape with the golden frame. And you can see that I get uh, those sunglasses. Now imagine that I had a, a 3D printer at home, which is um, uh, you know cheap uh, probably to, to print, let's say not now, but in five years, I, I could make my own uh, glasses, which, are, uh, with, which don't have any brand on it. So I'm making uh, my own uh, uh, version of, uh, of uh, glasses by using the eye. And I'm doing it without using any code, just by prompting. So prompting is the process of giving a command to the machine, which is in a natural language, meaning that I'm explaining it as I would do with another human, but in a way that the machine can actually uh, take this input, which is the prompt, and transform it into an output by using the underlying data set, which has been probably billions of parameters that those models use to actually generate this input. And as you can see, this is very interesting. And this give, uh, gives rise to uh, what we can call uh, AI creators, meaning those people that they can finally uh, use, um, you know, um, the, the um, uh, prompting to actually generate valuable, uh, valuable stuff. Um, and from a commercial standpoint, we're going to see uh, that, uh, you know, um, the, the AI industry, um, it's, um, it's uh, getting, uh, you know, um, is exploding. And I think when it comes to um, the, the AI marketplace, again, it's very important to look at it uh, with a human in the loop approach, because uh, even today, when we look at the AI, uh, there is a lot of training, curation, uh, and the maintenance of those models that uh, that we build. Even when we take like models like uh, civil diffusion, and we want to apply them to our business at an enterprise level, but even to scale them up um, to consumer level, we need to train them and we need to actually uh, tweak them in a way that uh, it makes it possible for many people to use it. And uh, model auditing is going to be extremely important because. Um, uh, a key point here is that, um, uh, you know, um, AI models come with uh, biases that uh, are intrinsic to the data, data set that we, was used to actually train the model. And sometimes we use so much data that is uh, very hard to understand what are the, uh, the intrinsic bias that uh, the model is going to have. We can understand that just by looking at the output. For instance, if you, if you, uh, you know, um, uh, look for, uh, if you, uh, you know, uh, give a prompt to, to an AI, um, you know, you tell it, uh, you know, just uh, represent a man uh, without saying uh, what sort of representation you want. And the AI is going to produce, for instance, let's say a white man, uh, you know that the AI has been trained on, uh, on a data set that, that has been biased in that direction. So uh, model auditing is going to be extremely important because it's going to pose otherwise a lot of questions about what biases the AI has. And so also the output is going to be biased, just like we humans, but doing it at scale with the AI it's going to be a very uh, huge black box. So my argument is that model auditing, so the ability of understanding the biases behind uh, AI model is going to be huge. So a lot of companies will be will be um, you know looking into this. And then of course um, the 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 um, uh, content uh, initially that AI is going to be able to to cover is going to be the content that can be commoditized. Meaning that for instance right now a lot of AI tools are useful also to write uh, content for blogs. But uh, usually, uh, if uh, the AI can write that content, it means that uh, it's content that can be commoditized. Uh, it's not going to be writing an opinion piece. And uh, in many cases, for instance, if I write something, it's because people want to hear my take about something. So it's something that cannot be replaced by the AI for now. Um, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to get to the point where the AI can express, of course, opinion again. Uh, based on the, the training that, uh, that we do. And then it's going to be about scaling up those models. So the ability to actually being able to uh, use those models uh, on a wide variety of tasks and uh, volume. 
Uh, and um, one interesting application, of course, is also about optimization. So DI, I think, is going to be extremely good in uh, in the in linear um, um, uh, optimization. So where the human is going to be extremely good in a strategic uh, betting and uh, understanding when to change direction for the business as the landscape of the context has changed. So I would say that the human is going to be extremely good in, uh, in monitoring uh, the context around the AI and the context around the business, the business landscape. The, the, the AI instead is going to be good, uh, extremely good in, uh, in uh, linear uh, efficiency, in linear uh, improvement and optimizations. So for instance, let's say that you're running uh, uh, campaigns uh, on, 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 on um, uh, paid campaigns on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or Google or whatever, the AI can be extremely good uh, in, uh, in understanding the historic data of those campaigns and then managing in a way that um, uh, is going to improve, um, you know, not exponentially, but um, uh, more and more uh, those campaigns until a certain extent where the human needs to understand how to actually um, uh, tweak the AI to make, the, to make it go a step farther. But how do you price the, uh, price the AI? Um, you know, there will be a different pricing model, and it's very important to understand, as we'll see, that uh, the underlying infrastructure of the AI for now is, uh, is, uh, is the cloud, uh, since, uh, you know, many cloud companies like uh, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google are trying to compete uh, with each other to actually um, uh, get as much as possible um, the other companies that are building AI tools, because those for now computer uh, uh, um, um, consume a lot of uh, computing power. And therefore, this, meaning, this means a lot of consumption of uh, cloud services. But, uh, you know, for pricing model, primarily, uh, subscribe to subscription retainer. So if you're uh, an AI service, for instance, uh, offering uh, to B2B, B2B, uh, you're going to be a subscription. An example is Jasper AI, where you can uh, subscribe and get uh, uh, up to a limit of um, uh, article. And then you get uh, pay as you go. Uh, and of course, uh, at an enterprise level, is going to be a retainer, meaning that uh, also as well, you're going to get, um, 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 you know, you're going to get a monthly retainer for the service uh, services offered. Uh, then you get pay as pay as you go. Uh, so um, for the consumption based on the the consumption of the platform and uh, how much content, for instance, you need to generate, uh, that's how much you're going to pay. And then hybrid pricing, uh, where you're going to get both a subscription and pay as you go. And then a cut of the saving, meaning that um, if you're running the AI on top of an infrastructure, especially for optimization reasons, and you're cutting the cost of doing business, uh, like for instance, imagine the AI uh, doing, uh, you know, campaigns optimizations for uh, paid marketing or AI doing uh, optimizations on the supply chain, you can uh, look at how much uh, savings AI is generating and based on those savings, the AI can actually, the company uh, providing the service can get a cut of those, uh, those savings. Um, and um, of course, um, at, uh, um, what's uh, interesting is that from an hardware um, standpoint, the DI, uh, it's uh, it's based on uh, infrastructure uh, and therefore physical infrastructure and the, the the really the underlying physical infrastructure of the for the AI is the the GPU. So if uh, we lived in an era of CPU for computing, uh, when it comes to AI, the GPU is going to be really the the computing uh, physical platform for it. That's why you see a lot of companies like uh, Apple or Google uh, switching their devices to to actually uh, to their own chips. So right now, chips have become uh, extremely important, especially AI chips, because um, the, the underlying physical infrastructure that enables AI are a very powerful chips. So if you can test them on your hardware, like Apple does or like Google does with the pixels, then you're going to be able to uh, create a vertical integration for the whole uh, AI uh, using your own, uh, your own chips. And the same is for companies like media. So it's extremely important to understand that uh, if you're a company like Apple, uh, you want to uh, make sure that uh, you can test and have such powerful chips that will be able to enable AI um, on top of your devices to do more and more stuff. Just as an example, the reason why the, the, the camera of uh, the, the Apple, uh, the, the iPhone, is uh, so powerful is not just because it has more mega, uh, it has more, uh, you know, pixels, but it's uh, uh, more resolution. It's because actually uh, the software within it uses algorithms uh, which are AI driven to actually adjust uh, and uh, improve the quality of the image. So the improvement of the quality of the image is not happening 
from uh, from an hardware standpoint so it's not the camera that is getting better but is happening in the software which is uh, underlying uh, driven uh, in the underlying infrastructure by uh, AI algorithms so if you understand that you understand that if you're apple google or any other company you want to uh, make sure that uh, you know uh, how to um, you know you want to vertically integrate so do you want to, you want to make sure that really um, you know the the AI, uh, the AI chips that you get within your devices are valuable to power up those devices and that you can evolve from there another extremely important point is that you know data is valuable but um, uh, you know as the the computing uh, power improves of course also AI models will improve but not all data is useful also for the eye uh, because uh, in order for the AI to make sense to create like valuable models, the data needs to be in many cases cleaned up a lot. And to say, if you're a company like Tesla, which has a lot of uh, interesting data about uh, self about uh, you know the the the, the mileage that uh, users uh, are driving, like uh, drivers of Tesla are doing, um, this is very valuable data that you can use to improve the AI. But uh, the main point that you need to understand is that for the AI to improve at a certain extent. Uh, you're going to need uh, um, uh, an exponentially growing number uh, of uh, data points. And the paradox is, uh, is that the more data you get, the more data you may, the, the I need uh, exponentially to actually improve uh, when you hit uh, a threshold. Uh, so um, it's important to, to build different models uh, uh, as the I skills to actually make it uh, valuable. This is counterintuitive, but uh, it's uh, what's going on, and that uh, connects us to to another point. Uh, I think it's uh, quite interesting to look at uh, this video here uh, of uh, that was shared a um, uh, few um, you know few time ago. You can see that um, the Tesla right now is uh, confusing a carriage for for um, for a truck. It's quite interesting. It, it doesn't know the, as you can see, it doesn't know that the Tesla doesn't know how to make sense of it. It transforms it in in uh, many things. So it's uh, it's uh, it's quite interesting um, to understand that there are still many uh, you know limitation of um, uh, what uh, uh, the eye can do, and uh, it's extremely important to actually understand that um, again. Also here, uh, the eye um, also when it has a lot of data points and you put it in a different context it actually um, is not able to make sense of the context. So again, um, you want to have guardrails for the eye to work properly, and meaning that um, this is going to open up a whole, I think, to me, uh, what is going to be the most interesting side of the eye is going to be the human in the loop, meaning uh, how the humans actually uh, train the eye, but also how the human create the proper context for the eye to work at best, meaning just like in the example of the Tesla that uh, wasn't uh, making sense of the carriage on the, on the highway, it's because uh, the carriage was not supposed to be there, um, and uh, or if you wish, the the self-driving car, uh, the the car, if the car is driving itself, it is not supposed to be there, because it cannot make sense of that object. So you want to have it on a on a context, so on a highway, when it's going to find all the other cars, like um, like uh, the the cars that has been used to train the eye. So it's going to be very linear context uh, where even if you find, um, you know, unpredictable things like, you know, a, a car um, uh, ahead of you, which is uh, breaking very, very quickly, still it's very predictable for the eye because, because it can recognize the context. And so it can make sense of it and therefore it can act very, very quickly, even better than human. So in that context, the eye can drive, can do way better than human can drive much better than humans and we can argue that humans are not good at all in driving so it's not, it's not going to be the art but i think it's the opposite so humans uh, if you're a human if you drive on the highway you recognize that it's pretty boring and i think it's where most of um, actually uh, accidents are happening because you get distracted or for instance uh, you fall asleep without realizing because it's very boring environment it's a context uh, which is very uh, sort of uh, predictable but um, uh, instead, if you're a human and you're driving in a, in a city when many things are happening, you were more careful about what going, what's going on. And that's where probably you you give your best as a driver. We can argue, uh, but you know it's uh, again it's also this is questionable. But the key point is just about the fact that the eye is going to be working extremely well uh, when we're going to design a very narrow context where uh, the eye is going to drive. And in that case, the eye is going to be doing way way better than the humans. There's no doubt about it. Uh, at least for me, there's no doubt that if you put the eye, the self-driving car on a highway where there are only other cars that 
uh, are the same shapes of the cars that we use to train the, the self-driving car that is driving right now, uh, then yeah, I can do way, way better. As of now, uh, what's going on is, uh, you know, the AI funding is uh, is uh, booming in a, a market slowdown. The reason why it's happening is not just because investors are going crazy. It's also because uh, uh, right now, uh, if you're able to bet on the right horse when it comes to AI industry, actually, um, you're going to uh, reap the benefit of uh, uh, having invested into the next probably trillion dollar company. That's why we see that Stability AI has uh, raised uh, 100 million with its uh, stable diffusion. We saw it before the example of prompting uh, stable diffusion to actually generate your your custom glasses, uh, sunglasses. And uh, then we got uh, the case of uh, <clears throat> Jasper AI, uh, which raised $125 million at uh, 1.5 billion valuation. Also, it's very interesting. And Jasper, it's very interesting itself because uh, it's not just an AI um, a tool, it's uh, AI content platform. It's very uh, important to understand that because it has a set of applications which are exploding over and over. And the same we can say about OpenAI, because if you look at the OpenAI playground, you're going to find uh, tons of uh, a great number of applications that AI can do, from question answering, like text generation, uh, uh, speech to text, and vice versa, image generation. So huge amount of things that you can do. And then, of course, the OpenAI, again, also here, um, OpenAI here, it's even more interesting, the news where is uh, is in talks to actually uh, talk uh, with uh, with Microsoft, and uh, the company is going to be worth uh, a lot of money. Uh, OpenAI, um, and if you think about it, um, that's the point that I want to make here. If you if you are if you are Microsoft, it's extremely important to be um, in in talks with uh, with uh, OpenAI because OpenAI, if, as as a provider of AI services, is going to be consuming a lot of uh, data into the cloud. So uh, you are Microsoft, uh, you are the owner of Microsoft Azure, uh, that is the main, one of the main cloud players in the space. And therefore, if you're able to be the owner of OpenAI, and OpenAI is gonna, is gonna aspire a whole AI industry, uh, is gonna be the one of the winner take all, as you can imagine, this is gonna generate a trillion dollar potential industry. And as a cloud provider, it's gonna be interesting for you. Of course, to me, as a business person, I would like to see uh, AI, uh, an underlying infrastructure of AI that is decentralized. So it's sitting uh, on top of infrastructure, which is not owned by Microsoft or by Google or by Amazon, but it's going to be decentralized in some way. Uh, <clears throat> and that is going to be interesting to plug other applications. But for now, let's stop here because otherwise we're going to get into the buzzy uh, world of, uh, of uh, blockchain technologies. Uh, but um, this is the landscape of AI so far. Uh, I hope it makes sense. Um, I hope to do more like that in the future. I hope to be. Uh, I hope it was both practical, but also a little bit of theory in it, so that we understand what the AI can do, what it cannot do. I think as uh, people that deal with the AI from a commercial standpoint, both at enterprise level or consumer level, we want to be the first to understand the real potential of AI. We want to make sure that we explain the the myths uh, uh, around it in a very sincere way. So. We try to make it in a way that uh, you know you tell people uh, what you believe the AI can can uh, can really do, uh, and uh, you don't try to sell it just because um, you want to uh, be on an industry that right now is exploding. But you really um, are passionate about it. You try to understand how the product works, uh, the commercial applications, what will make sense. And as a commercial person, as someone who deals a lot with uh, with uh, customers and applications in the real world, I think you're going to be extremely valuable. Because uh, you understand uh, what are the next uh, commercial applications which will be able to scale this technology.